Is faith the enemy of science? Picture this. Betty the botanist is a world-renowned scientist. She's been up all night working in the lab. When Larry the lab assistant arrives, Betty says, Larry, that specimen you gave me yesterday was fascinating. I've been working through the night to run tests on it. I've done a spectral analysis. I've found all sorts of pharmacological properties that will help us in the fight against Alzheimer's. I've mapped its genome, which is a first for the species. I cannot thank you enough for the specimen. Specimen, says Larry. Yesterday was February the 14th. Valentine's Day. It was a long-stemmed rose, Betty. Do you understand what I gave you? So that's the question. Does Betty understand the rose? And from one perspective, she understands it better than anyone else on the planet. From another perspective, she's a moron. Because there is more to this rose than can be discovered by cutting it up and putting it under a microscope. And that something more is not to be found by doing more lab work. The meaning of the rose is not the same thing as its material properties. Its meaning will have to be discovered in other ways. The Christian position is this. The whole world is like that rose. The world is a gift given by someone trying to communicate his love. Therefore, the world can be studied scientifically, certainly, but it can also be understood on other levels because scientific knowledge is not the only kind of knowledge that's possible. And it's not the only kind of knowledge that's desirable. We don't want less than scientific knowledge, but we do want a whole lot more. Betty would be very foolish if she tells Larry, this cannot be a love gift because that's not written in its DNA. There is more to the rose than what shows up under a microscope. And there is more to the world than what can be discovered scientifically. Science tells us about mechanisms and materials, but it's not set up to tell us about a maker or the meaning. Science is great at asking what questions and how questions, but it's not designed to answer why questions and what for. That doesn't mean that Christians don't love science. Modern science was basically pioneered by Christians in the 16th and 17th centuries at Christian universities for Christian reasons. People like Copernicus and Newton pursued their science because they firmly believed certain truths about God, the world, and ourselves. In fact, those beliefs, the beliefs we've been exploring in 321, are foundational to science. To do science, you need to believe in three things at least. Laws up above, a world out there, and minds in here. You need to believe these three things and that these three things triangulate. You need the laws of nature to rule the world, and you need to be able to understand them. Even little old us needs to be able to understand the laws up above and the world out there. It was Albert Einstein who said that this is an utter miracle, that these three things line up. He said, the eternal mystery of the world is its comprehensibility. The fact that it is comprehensible is a miracle. Why should scientific laws hold across time and space? And why should they be understood by human beings? Christian faith casts light on this mystery. It says that God, the world, and ourselves are integrated. From page one of the Bible, humans are said to be in the image of God and to have a special role in the world, naming and ruling it. We should expect to understand something of the laws up above and the world out there. This Christian faith does not oppose science. Such faith gave birth to science in the first place, and such faith continues to animate many scientists today. It is not a tug of war between faith and science. When we see a rose... We see a botanical specimen and a symbol of love. When we see the world, we can understand it as a scientist and as a person of faith. You do not have to choose. Faith and science are not enemies. <laughs>